I am not a Spurs fan. I am not fanboying when I talk about Manu Ginobili. The only two players I would do that for are Anderson Varejao and Duncan Robinson. I've forgotten the Alamo so many times. I'll say it again. I am not a Spurs fan. So, with that said, Manu Ginobili is the man. A consummate winner and one of the great underdogs ever. How much of an underdog was he, you may wonder? Well, he was drafted in the 1999 NBA Draft. And out of 58 players drafted, he was pick number 57. Emmanuel Ginobili. The Spurs had just won the title and were basically planning on just running it back. They didn't really want to draft anyone that they'd have to give a roster spot to. Of course, the Spurs were way ahead of the curve on scouting international players, so they knew Manu had potential. But their plan was still to just draft and stash a dude with the next to last pick in case he someday turned into something they could use. For all intents and purposes, he was just some guy. And then, all of a sudden, he became the guy. Manu spent the next few years playing overseas in the Italian League. By 2002, he had won the Italian League MVP award twice, the Italian League Championship, the Italian League Cup Championship twice, the Italian Cup MVP, was twice the EuroLeague Finals scoring leader, was a EuroLeague first team choice, and was a EuroLeague champion and finals MVP. By 2002, Manu Ginobili was the best overseas player in the world. And the Spurs had his draft rights. He was like an Argentinian basketball Bitcoin or whatever. Boy, that was a weird thing to say. You know what else is weird? The internet. One minute you're looking up something sweet and innocuous. And the next thing you know, you're being socially engineered by some creep on the internet for weeks at a time until you're ripe for their crypto scam. If only you'd use today's sponsor, NordVPN. NordVPN has threat protection that can help warn you about people who might not be who they say and recognize potentially malicious links and websites. And it's not just random weirdos that NordVPN helps protect you from. Its robust features help shield you and your data from malware, trackers, and these super rich and powerful weirdos. I'm talking big boy encryption, and it couldn't be easier to use. Just one click and boom, job done. To get started, go to nordvpn.com slash Clayton Crowley to get four extra months for free when you sign up for a two-year plan. That's nordvpn.com slash Clayton Crowley. Which didn't really make his life that easy when the Spurs brought him over to be a 25-year-old rookie in 2003. On top of the regular rookie hazing that most guys get, Manu got extra doses because of his hype from the front office and because he was coming from overseas back when most players still thought those guys were soft. Vets like Kevin Willis and Steve Smith made sure that Manu understood he was at the bottom of the pecking order. But nobody kicked his ass more than Bruce Bowen. It had to have been good for Manu's development that he was getting tested every day by one of the dirtiest, craftiest, most decorated defenders of his generation but man, it could not have been easy. Tim Duncan is literally quoted as saying that Bruce beat the ever-loving shit out of him. And Tim is another guy who didn't really buy into all of the Manu hype. Manu had to prove that he belonged as a part of the culture that Duncan and David Robinson had been cultivating. And no one was gonna make that easy for him. Certainly not Manu. To watch Manu Ginobili play was to watch nuclear fusion on a basketball court. It was non-stop energy, a play style that burned so brightly and unpredictably, it felt like it needed to be viewed through a pinhole. Sometimes it wouldn't work. He was a risk taker, a gambler, and sometimes that nuclear fusion would go supernova and blow right the hell up. We'll get into the specifics later, but Manu has his fair share of big time blunders under his belt. But at his core, he was first and foremost a winner. He made winning plays, he dictated winning outcomes, his gambles paid off, and those wild solar flares helped keep the Spurs a thriving ecosystem. And it happened pretty quick. Manu won his first championship in his rookie year, 2003. He was coming off the bench and the Spurs benefited from a prime Tim Duncan, 
but he still ended up finishing third on the team in playoff win shares, behind just Duncan and Robinson. Duncan Robinson. By 2005, Manu had definitely arrived. He'd become the Spurs' full-time starting shooting guard and was named an all-star. And on the biggest stage, with the most pressure, he flourished. He was excellent in the playoffs, finishing with the third most points scored in the entire postseason. He helped the Spurs reach their third final series in seven years, where he was a menace against the Pistons. He was arguably the Spurs' best player in Game 1, definitely their best player in Game 2. Hit Robert Ory with the pass when he was doubled at the end of Game 5, an underrated play that he made look easy, and he brought the Spurs home in Game 7 with 11 points in the fourth quarter. People like Chauncey Billups, former Spurs assistant Mike Budenholzer, and Spurs GM R.C. Buford all contend that Manu should have been, at minimum, co-MVP with Duncan. Or, really, the MVP of the 2005 Finals. In a slog fest of a series in which Duncan himself had some real stinkers, the Spurs over and over again looked to Manu to bail them out, to initiate and create the offense. And he came through. But you know what? I feel like we're getting a little bit away from the point. I can give you the ins and outs of all of Manu's seasons and give you a year-by-year -year rundown of his career. But I feel like that misses out on the essence of what Manu is or what he represents. I mean, for one thing, he was almost certainly the most interesting man during his time in the league. Uh, Clayton, why do you say that? Well, he caught a fucking bat out of midair for one thing. You see, I find a lot of these little fun facts doing the research for these videos. Like the fact that the Spurs arena is located between two of the largest bat colonies in the world and their migratory path to Mexico. So it's not uncommon for a bat to get stuck inside the arena. What is uncommon is for an NBA player to snatch it with his bare hands. Which is exactly what Manu Ginobili did in 2009 when a bat interrupted a Spurs game on Halloween. Just walked out there like, give me that shit. And then he just picked it up and handed it to somebody. After the game, he had to get like rabies shots. That's just how Manu rolled. He's a fascinating dude a naturally curious and inviting soul by all accounts. He'd read books about the history of humankind on road trips. He loves astronomy and geeked out after he got to meet Neil deGrasse Tyson. He had a huge hand in getting the Spurs to go out to dinner and was usually one of the guys picking where they'd eat. He rocked an iconic bald spot and he drove a minivan. It doesn't get much cooler than that. Oh, what? You don't think driving a minivan is cool? You don't think Manu was like that? Well, listen up, Buster. Manu was like that. I guess I did forget to mention that he won the Italian League Dunk Contest in 2001. Oops. But yeah, the dude with the bald spot and a little bit of a schnoz would put you on a poster if you weren't careful. That nuclear fusion had a form and that form had style. Manu Ginobili was a crazy man, yes. He was zany and creative, a southpaw mad scientist who bounced off of guys like a pinball. But he was also a complete, multi-dimensional player. The most well-rounded scorer the Spurs had employed since the Iceman, George Gervin, in the 1970s. Manu was fearless attacking the basket and obviously more athletic than people seemed to expect with shades of Pistol Pete, Kobe Bryant, and Drazen Petrovic shining out through the canvas of his game. He was a creative, ballsy, brilliant passer, a wildly underrated defender, one of the masters of tough shot making. He loved to take a charge, was built as tough as they come, and he's almost singularly responsible for introducing the NBA to the Eurostep. He didn't invent the Eurostep, and he wasn't the first one to do it, in the same way that Iverson didn't invent the crossover and Babe Ruth didn't invent the home run. But the Eurostep is his move. His signature sidestep is one of the most popular and effective weapons in the sport now, but he would get called for traveling violations when he first started showing it off. The refs just weren't used to seeing it. He was outstanding. It ought to be pretty telling that the best perimeter players in the world today play a whole lot like Manu Ginobili did. 
or that every other great player who faced Manu Ginobili raves about him. LeBron loved Manu. Wade loved Manu. Durant would go on rants about what a killer Ginobili was. Kobe never missed an opportunity to single out and heap praise onto Manu. I mean, one of Chuck's great bits just centered around yelling Manu's name. What? Ginobili! Ginobili! I find it endlessly fascinating that all of the great, great players who competed against Manu had glowing, outsized praise for him compared to what you'd normally hear from the national media. It's like they sensed something inside him, recognized that he was made of the same stuff they were, and that he belonged to their secret fraternity of excellence. And the one thing said about Manu Ginobili, the refrain of his career, the word that I saw used to describe him more than any other by a mile, was that he had the heart of a champion and the will of a competitor. Seriously, I don't think I've seen one word used so ubiquitously to describe a player. I mean, we talked about what an underdog he was, how he had to defy his draft position and prove himself to his teammates, but he also had to prove himself to pop. I mean, you can imagine the Spurs, the Patriots of basketball, an institution of the sport that stands for consistency and substance over style, who pride themselves on finding guys who will simply do what they're told. Not exactly Manu's forte. And it drove Pop crazy. The wild passes, the impossible shots, the breakneck pace, it was all just very unspursy. But no matter how hard Pop tried, how many ass chewings he gave out, or how many drills he restarted, Manu kept gaining ground. He kept doing things his way, and it kept working more often than it didn't. It wasn't that he was trying to one-up Pop or undo the Spurs way. It was just, as he told Pop, My mom, this is what I do. It has to mean something that Manu Ginobili, ever the underdog, took on the Spurs, big brother, the establishment, the machine, and won. As Pop said later, Manu has changed me as a coach. He's made me believe that you can do the strange and unpredictable and be out of position once in a while, yet still make something positive happen. Whatever he does, he does only to win because he has the exact competitive nature of a Michael Jordan. In the end, Manu Ginobili was perfect for the Spurs. Sure, he played with about as much leeway on his leash as the rest of the team put together, but he got what they were about as evidenced by a hundred things, but most importantly, his agreement to come off the bench. Pop saw an opportunity with Manu to gain a nearly unprecedented advantage. He would ask this unrivaled competitor, the one who didn't care about winning a finals MVP, to forego a starting role and feast instead on reserve units. And Manu said yes. Think about that, in 2005, the season where Manu really broke through. He started in 74 games, became an all-star, and was the runner-up for the Finals Most Valuable Player Award. By 2007, two years later, he was starting in less than half of the Spurs games. And of course, the Spurs continued to be the most successful basketball franchise in the NBA for another decade. I'd argue that Manu coming off the bench had as much to do with the Spurs' impeccable culture as Tim's ability to be coached. The two set an unimpeachable example. Oh shit, Pop's really getting after Tim Duncan. Well, he is Tim Duncan, and he's taking it. I guess I can't complain. Man, I really wish I had more minutes. Well, Manu Ginobili is coming off the bench, so I guess I don't have that much room to talk. He was exactly what the Spurs needed. In an organization that wanted players to color inside the lines, he painted outside them. And rather than change the artist, the Spurs moved the lines. When the Spurs were known for their plotting pace and their exhaustingly effective post-game, Manu breathed life into their team. He was always willing to sacrifice. He took less pay and he didn't care about his place on all NBA teams or all-time leaderboards but he never compromised. He played his way. He was the people's champ, the one that felt the way they felt. When the fans were sad, 
You could tell that he was sad. When they were excited, he was excited. If Tim Duncan was the soul and Tony and Pop were the brain, then Manu Ginobili was the heart of the Spurs. The thing that gave them that vitality. Beating, coursing, fighting, fluttering, sinking, rising. And part of that, a huge part, is that he wasn't perfect. Unlike so much of the Spurs' trademark stoicism, he was human. He messed up, sometimes really bad. In the second round of the 2006 playoffs, the Spurs faced Dirk's Mavericks. And the 60-win Mavs jumped out to a very contested 3-1 series lead. The Spurs battled back and forced a seventh game in San Antonio, which quickly got out of hand. The Spurs had to come back from a 20-point deficit, which they did. With the game tied and 30 seconds left on the clock, Manu let it fly. Ginobili for three. Yes! Coming down the other way, there were only two things that the Spurs couldn't afford to do. Give up a wide-open three or foul a shot under the basket, which is exactly what Manu did. Nowitzki goes right at Bowen. The foul! Dirk made the shot, converted the three-point play, and the Mavs won the game in overtime. A 63-win season, over, just like that. And the Ray Allen shot in the 2013 finals? Yeah, Manu had a little bit to do with that too. He shot only two of five from the floor, missed an absolutely crucial free throw in the last minute, and had a career-high eight turnovers in the game. It's not an exaggeration to say that it might have been the worst game he had ever played for the Spurs. And it came right on the heels of a Game 5 in which he was exceptional. R.C. Buford, one of the great minds of basketball, said, I don't think I've ever seen a person so hard on himself. He is maybe the greatest competitor we have witnessed here. Which explains why Manu always bounced back. In 2007, the year after his gaffe against the Mavs, the Spurs won the NBA championship. In 2014, Manu took a 50% pay cut and the Spurs famously recaptured their glory with a stunning display of team-first basketball that featured Mr. Gino Beely very prominently. That title was iced when their 36-year-old sixth man reached all the way back and threw down a vintage slam on Chris Bosh. It's the story of Manu's career. He takes the risks, he gambles, but at his very core, no matter the age, no matter the odds, the guy is just a winner. He is no stranger to being the underdog, nor upending those odds and winning at the highest level. Evidenced best in the 2004 Summer Olympic Games. Some of you might have been wondering what's taken me so long to talk about it. And the rest of you probably don't know what I'm talking about. A deception, a hoodwink, a bamboozle, a flimflam, if you will. I have completely ignored the crowning achievement of Manu Ginobili's career, one of the most significant feats ever accomplished in basketball history, certainly in the history of international competition. Manu Ginobili and the Golden Generation. Players like Luis Scola, Pablo Prigioni, Fabricio Alberto, Carlos Delfino, and Manu Ginobili. Entering the Olympics, the Argentinian national team was a feel-good story. They were all very close, friends with each other, hung out with each other's families, spent time together away from the game. And Manu had assumed the role as leader of the team. Very wholesome stuff. But this was the Olympics. Since basketball was introduced as an Olympic sport in 1936, the United States had won the gold medal 12 out of 15 games. When the US met Argentina in the Olympic semifinal, they made a fatal mistake. They underestimated the Argentinians and their leader. Argentina won the game 89 to 81. They went on to defeat Italy in the gold medal game, becoming the first country since 1988 to beat out the States for the gold medal. They are still the only team to win the gold medal over the U.S. since we started sending NBA players with the Dream Team in 92. In fact, they are one of only three countries 
to ever win the gold medal other than the US, along with the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. And I don't know if you know this, but the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia aren't countries anymore. Which means that the only country that exists to have won a gold medal for basketball at the Olympics, other than the United States, is Argentina. And the man who gets the lion's share of credit for that is Manu Ginobili. He could have done it differently. On any other NBA team, he would have been a first option. He could have been a Tracy McGrady or a Vince Carter with the all-star games and a handful of all-NBA picks. Instead, he came off the bench and established himself as the greatest sixth man of the modern era. He is perhaps the most influential non-starter in all of sports. A major, vital, key part of the winningest trio in basketball history, he possesses the highest career winning percentage of any NBA player to have played in 1,000 games or more. An underdog, a four-time NBA champion, an Olympic gold medalist. Manu is all of that. But like I said earlier, yeah, numbers, yeah, accolades. But that's not what he was all about. Manu was Manu. And to describe him best, to sum up his essence, I think Charles did it best. You just gotta yell it. Jello, please!